Good evening, friends. It's a privilege to be here tonight and enjoying this wonderful uh, musical feast, enjoying these songs when they're sang with real enthusiasm. I was watching Jimmy, I believe it is, and if we could just be as enthused about all the things of God in our own life as Jimmy is in the emotion of them singing, we would get somewhere. <laughs> and I really appreciate that boy, his father, our good friend. I want to ask the question. These ladies that sing this, I'd like to talk it over. Is that the same group that sang many years ago when I was here? Is that the same? I have tried everywhere to find that song. In my dark hours of trials, I've tried to think that I'd like to talk it over. Jimmy McGuire, did you get that uh, on tape, I hope? And have you got it on a record? And uh, if it is, I want it. And I've tried to think that, I think that you love me when my path was so dim, see. And I, I certainly enjoyed that beautiful song of Zion. Now, I understand, I'm not sure of this, but I believe that this same group is going to be singing at the Businessman's Convention, um, I believe, Sunday, next Sunday. I think that's right, if I didn't misunderstand it. Two o'clock next Sunday. So you like this kind of singing? Why, they'll be over there to sing for us again. We'll carry them down to Tucson tomorrow night. <laughs> uh, and let them sing down there. I, I'm sure it'd be a blessing to the people. Now, tomorrow night is the Tucson chapter. We're going to be at the Ramada Inn tomorrow night down in Tucson, which you all understand that Phoenix is merely the outskirts of Tucson. <laughs> We're certainly glad to have you all as fellow citizens of our great economy of Arizona. Uh, we're on the hill. You're in the valley. So remember, <laughs> about 2,000 feet higher than you are, you see. So this outskirts of the city, we're certainly glad to be here fellowshipping with you tonight. So remember tomorrow night, in the main spot of Arizona will be the, uh, the chapter's uh, banquet. And um, then the next night, we are here at, I uh, forget the name of the church now, it's uh, South Side Assembly. And then uh, Wednesday night, we're at uh, Leventh and Garfield, I believe, the Assemblies of God there. For, and then Thursday starts the convention. Now you're so nice, and we've had such a wonderful time this week of fellowship in all these churches all up and down the Maricopa Valley here. And the Lord has certainly blessed us exceedingly abundantly, more than I expected Him to do. The places have been crowded and packed into the yards and the people standing, and a great fellowship around the Word. The ministers has visited. I've noticed the pastor, Brother Outlaw, I've seen him in every service we've had, as far as I can think of. And others have just come from one church to another. That's the way to do it. I like that. Fellowshipping one with another. As old Brother Bosworth that's been in glory now three or four years, he said to me, you know what fellowship is, Brother Branham? I said, I think so. He said, it's two fellas sharing one ship. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. Two fellas in the one ship. So we're, I'm glad looking out over the audience tonight seeing uh, friends here that I haven't seen before. Uh, it's come all the way from Kentucky and Indiana and around, up in Ohio, sitting around here visiting us. We're certainly glad to have them in tonight. Maybe been in other meetings, but uh, larger buildings just haven't noticed you. So the Lord bless you real richly. And now I am going to just stay a little while. I've got to drive the family back tonight, and we're to be ready for the meeting tomorrow in Tucson. So we're going down tonight after service. That's just about 125 miles and a long stretch of desert, and I'm sleepy and tired. So I will try to let you out. Now, I said this morning that as I brought that prophet to the top of the hill, um, I, or that was last night, wasn't it? And this morning, 
we was uh, speaking on something else. But I don't mind you being late for the uh, for your work, and I don't mind if you miss a day now and then. But don't miss Sunday school, see? So we want you at Sunday school. Now, tonight, before we approach the Word, let's approach the author by prayer. I want to say just before that, too, this lovely little choir, these uh, children of God, I say appreciate them. They're fine singing. And Brother Moore slipped out on me. I was going to turn this service to him, but he, he slipped out. I just see his lovely wife sitting here. So let's bow our heads now for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we are coming again tonight first to give thanks to you for all that you have given to us. And above all that you have given us, that eternal life stands out. For we know that we shall meet again, no more on this earth, in the earth that is to come. Now bless thy word tonight. And we thank you for how you have blessed the singing. I pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless the singing, the songs, and the singers. The pastor of this church, its co-pastors, and also the deacons, trustees, and all that it stands for. Bless them, Father. We pray that you'll uh, bless the message tonight. These few words that's been uh, selected out, we pray that you'll add the context to it and will give to us of thy blessings. Heal all the sick and the afflicted. May men and women tonight catch the vision, understand what God's program is for this last day. That's all we need to do is just get into His program. And then other things will take care for themselves. He taught us that way. And we, he said, seek First, the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All other things shall be added. So let us come back tonight, Lord, to the kingdom blessings, to the kingdom program, and learn of Thee. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm just a teeny bit hoarse from much speaking. I know it's warm in here, and I feel sorry for all who are standing, especially those ladies that's standing around the walls and out into the vestibule. And I'll hurry just as quick as possibly, just as quick as I can. And while I'm reading or speaking, just remember the ominous present God is always here present. And as the brother said about the epileptic of the last time we were here, a God can heal cancer, paralysis, whatever it is. He has already done it. If He can just get you to believe that, you're not saved uh, tonight. You've been saved. You were saved 1,900 years ago. And now maybe tonight you'll accept that salvation. But... It's already paid for. The debt has been cleared up. And the devil that put you in the pawn shop, Jesus came and redeemed you and opened up the doors. The only thing you have to do is walk out and claim your liberty. So you have a receipt from God that the debt is paid. Jesus said in his last words, It is finished. Every redemptive blessing was completely finished. God's great wrath on sin, when He became sin for us, it was the debt was settled. Satan has no more power, only as he can bluff with it. If he can bluff you into it, all right, you'll have to have it. But legally, he has no power at all. Every power he had was taken from him at Calvary. That's where the price is paid. He is nothing but a bluff. If you want to listen to his bluff, well, all right. But you don't have to. You are free tonight. He has made you free. And now, if something in the Word can make you realize that you are free by his grace, 
or if something real in the Word makes you understand or some act of God, that it included you, it includes us all, then you just accept it on those bases and you're free also. You don't have to feel any difference. You don't have to feel anything at all. It's not based upon... Jesus never did say, did you feel it? He said, did you believe it? Amen. It's faith. That's our... That's our... our faith is, is an arm, a mighty arm that holds the sharp two-edged sword of God. And that sharp two-edged sword will cut every promise free if that arm of faith is able to yield that sword. Some people has very weak uh, uh, muscle trouble. And you can just maybe cut off a little scratch enough to join a church. Others can come into justification some can go all the way to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A great strong arm holding this Bible can cut every promise free. So be strong in the Lord. Now I wish to read tonight from a little uh, context that uh, I've wrote some notes down here. It's found over in the book of Judges, of the 16th chapter of Judges, 27th and 28th verses. To draw... For context, what I wish to say. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistine were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, Remember me. I pray thee, strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O Lord God, that I may be once avenged of the Philistines of my two eyes. May the Lord add his blessings to the word. If I should call it a text, I'd like to take this for the next few moments. Lord, just this once again. Just one more time, Lord. Hallelujah. There was about, as the Scripture says, about 3,000 Philistines looking down from the high galleys of the stadium as the pair entered the great stadium, a Colosseum. Highly honored warlords, their fine jewel ladies, as they sat in this place, and the announcer said that Samson enters the floor. They must have raised up, moved up a little closer, stretched as it were their necks to get a good look. And what could they see but a mass of human flesh, a man that was once the great warrior, being led blindly as he was led by a little boy that led him out into the floor. All day long, the halls echoed from wall to wall with the reverie of drunken women and men. What a sight it must have been. What a hush must have come over the building when this man, led by a little boy, an arch enemy to them, come walking out in the floor with no eyes, had to be led by a little lad a man that had been such a gallant man, a man that had been the warrior that Samson was, and then had to be led by a little boy out in the floor. And a man that was a servant of God brought into this condition 
into this place of drunken revel. It was a great celebration for their god Dagon, the fish god, that had gotten the victory over Jehovah. Let's stop a minute and let that penetrate. Celebrating a victory over Jehovah's host. Dagon, the heathen idol, the fish god of the Philistines, that God had hated. And here they was in their drunken brawl, celebrating victory over God. Servant being conquered. What a terrible thing that is to think of. I like if it was possible to stand still a few minutes and paint a picture of that. But just imagine it in your mind. If you would have had to stand and look on something like that, then I'm going to bring the picture right back to you. Just imagine, all day long, drinking, celebration, fine-dressed women, men, warlords, warriors, great men of the nation, gathered in this new building where they'd put up a new idol to the fish god giving him honor and praise for the victory over Jehovah's servants. Now, to make it worse, here come the leading man, the messenger of the day, with his eyes punched out, led by the hand of some little boy to bring him out into the stadium. The lad led the stumbling blind out into the place, and I can hear a whisper from the, the great massive man standing there like a great machine, but totally helpless. God had raised him up for a purpose, sold his birthrights, and here he stood a mass of machinery with no strength in it. Led around by a little boy. But no doubt in my mind that Samson had thought of all these things. When he had lost his strength, he had thought about what had happened. Thou had been taken from him, and he had surrendered to his enemy, and they had, in return, had took his sight from his eyes. And he said to the little lad, Lead me to the post, or the column that the building is set upon. Just lead me over to this post. And think of it, they had him out there making sport out of him, entertaining that drunken bunch. What a reproach that was. What a disgrace that was. What an example that is. To... It puts me in the mind of a defeated nation that's morally decayed as Samson stood by the side of this column, making sport for the enemy, humiliated and broken. What a condition he was in, a very gracious symbol of a fallen nation, a morally corrupted nation, a fallen church, 
that sold its birthrights, fallen into moral decay, and surrendered itself to the enemy. A public example, though you was raised up to serve God, but a fall away into moral decay gets you in that condition. What an example that was. I can just hear all the warriors around, all the ladies uh, with their beads and bracelets and fine jewels and so forth, said, so this is Samson. This is that mighty one that you've talked about. This is that man that you said the spirit of the great gods lived in. This is the man that could take over our nation you talked about. But look at him now. What an example. What a lesson it ought to be to us. What a solemn thing it ought to be. We should not just approach this as just uh, uh, come together to have a good time. In a celebration, we come together to see where we are standing. Amen. To see what's happening to us. And I could hear, and Samson no doubt could hear, from one side to the other, the people who had heard about him. Well, and so this is Samson. I wonder today if the enemy can't also at this time say about the same thing about our Pentecostal move. Yes. Just to speak the name Samson, they would all get nervous. Because he was anointed servant of God. He was born with a Nazarite gift. And they know that there was nothing could stop that Nazarite gift as long as he held it. He was God's chosen man of the day. God's chosen messenger of the day. Many of them thought, what this must be. Many of them remembered him. Many remembered as they looked at this helpless creature standing there with his arms around the post, blind, making fun of him, hitting him with whips, saying, come on out, Samson, you great strong man. Do something about it. You who are so strong. Where is your God? If that isn't just about the way that the enemy likes to do, yeah. when he can get you down. Amen. But he's daring to try that as long as the power of God's operating through the church. He's a, he'd be afraid to do that when the Nazarite blessings is up on you. But if he can see you whipped, that's when he makes fun of you. That's when he can say there's no difference between them and us. They're just the same man like we are. But when there's something different, something outstanding with Jehovah's blessings on it, then they're scared to say anything. As long as they can see that power of God working, the devil's got sense enough to keep his mouth shut. But when he knows you're defeated, he turns every devil he can loose on you. That's the condition that Samson was standing in. Let's just think, as I can see the warriors, some of them old veterans with scars on their faces. As they looked at Samson standing there, hopeless and helpless, they remembered of seeing him stand one time with a jawbone in his hand and a thousand Philistines laying dead at his feet. And now a little boy is leading him around by the hand. They could remember how they questioned in their council 
when the news was brought that a man, a mere man, took the, an old sunburnt, roasted jawbone of a mule. And now many of you have taken the history of the Philistines. Those armors that those men wore, the helmet over their head was almost an inch thick with brass. And their coat that they wore, they were great mighty men, was great laps of half-inch brass up and down their body to cover it from a long spear coming or a, a hard a strike with a two-edged sword that would have to knock them off their feet. Now, how could a man, just one man with a thousand around him, armored and dressed warriors with spears, those big helmets that only the eye showed through, how could a man take a jawbone of a mule and beat down a thousand of them at one time? while the first lick with that old brittle jawbone would fly to pieces on one of those helmets. They know that some supernatural strength. When he struck that warrior on the head, the thing dented in and killed him instantly. Right hand and left hand he struck, and every time he struck, the power of God struck with it. It doesn't take... What we would think a great thing, it only takes a, a hand that's completely anointed with the Holy Ghost, Amen. with God's power to strike down any enemy under any circumstance. Amen. And how those warriors remembered him. Could it be possible that we got the wrong man? Some of them might have said. No, that's him. I could just see his statue. That's Samson. The one who served what he said was a true God. But his God sure has forsaken him. But they were wrong. God had not forsaken him. He had forsaken God. And I think that's about the way with the people tonight. It isn't God has forsaken His church. It's the church has forsaken God and His Word. That's what's the matter. Notice, many of them remembered the group that stood over on one side said, I can remember when Delilah took and bound him with ropes that us even the uh, horses couldn't pull apart. And when we come up on him, how that they was like little threads. He just broke them to pieces. And here he stands defeated. And another group could remember one night down at Gaza, how that they pinned him in but he still had the anointing on him. Yes. And they tried to pin him in and shut the gates on him. They said, now we'll pounce upon him. But the Spirit of the Lord returned to him. Lord. And he picked up the whole gates and walked up on the hill with them. Yes. When a man is in the line of duty for God, there's no Gate, no, nothing can stand in his way. Amen. The devil tried to fence God's man and people in one day with the Red Sea, but he went right on to it just the same. When as long as a man is in the service of God, as long as the anointing and blessing is up on him, he shouldn't fear nothing. Because he's promised us he'd be with us. And nothing would bother us by no means. But this is an example of what happens when God is long-suffering, finally wears out with you. Now, He's long-suffering. But remember, His patience has an end. 
Now, Samson was doing wrong the very night they had him down there. But finally, God got enough of it. He couldn't correct him. My prayer is that God never let this Pentecostal church get to a place to where God's patience is wore out with you. He'll send messengers, as we've taught this week, rising up prophets down through the ages, foretelling His Word and bringing His Word back, and then you continually walk away from it. You'll find yourself blind to do. Powerless, helpless, defeated. And I'm afraid that's where we're getting to. See, Samson fell for glamour. The very thing that the church today is falling for. Glamour. What a pity it is to see these things happening. Yes, when they tried to fence in the power of God, they found out that they could not do it. Samson picked those great big iron gates up that would have weighed tons, walked up on the hill with them and laid them down. Certainly nobody's going to take after him. They know better. And when a man comes in the anointing of the Holy Ghost and with the word of the Lord, with thus saith the Lord, you better have better sense than try to attack it. Because <laughs> you find there's a hand of the living God, and it's heavy. But we find out that there was another group there that one day seen him on his road down and a lion run out on him and roared. And a lion is a dangerous animal that can kill a man within a split second. Four or five of them. Just one rake's all he needs. And this lion being disturbed and they notice the action as they watch the lion. And the lion probably disturbed him, was angry. And he flashed out after Samson. And there he stood helpless. But all of a sudden, oh, he's a very present help in time of trouble. All of a sudden. Why can't you sick people think that tonight? Why can't you who are afraid that somebody will say something against you, something about you? They said it about Jesus. Amen. All of a sudden, he was a subject to the power of God. And each one of you through confession and faith is a subject to all the powers there is both in heavens and earth to come up on you. Samson, while standing there, the power of God come up on him, and the lion made a jump for him. He just caught him in the mouth and ripped him open with his hands. And could that man that would do a thing like that, here stands the same man, defeated, helpless, and blind. I can almost point you to a church like that. Helpless, defeated, and blind. Rejecting the promises. Rejecting the Word. A church that Christ promised. Amen. That would have power over sickness. In my name they shall cast out devils. Amen. Taking up a devil and casting him away. And the blessings that he promised his church. And because the church has turned from prayer meetings and from sincerity and made the religion of Christ a tradition. And it's took all the strength out of it. Glamour come into our churches. And she stands just about defeated. Oh, my. There he stood, all stripped of power by a woman. 
just because his eyes went wanting, because some immoral Jezebel set up a system to conquer the servant of God. May I say this with reverence? There has been formed a system of Jezebel that's conquering, bringing them all into a federation, all the denominations, Pentecostals and all, into the world council of churches, which is no more than a trap of the devil to take away from you what you've got. Then she'll laugh at you. Strip the power by that woman. Pentecost, a few years ago, no more than 50 years ago, stood out. The people stood different. They come out of, of different groups of worldliness because of their worldliness and stood out as an example and God has stuck that church. And today it's one of the most powerful churches in the world. But the thing that she's doing, she's turned right straight back around and went back into the same conglomeration that she was called out of. And when she begins to do that, her power is taken from her. Where do we get the all-night prayer meetings? Let the preacher preach till about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning like they used to do. He'd be preaching empty seats. He got to go home and see We Love Susie or somebody on... Certain television cast. Now, that's the truth. Why? Where your treasures is, there your heart is also. Our treasures ought to be in the Word. The Arizona people are prospectors. You ought to go dig in a while. <laughs> See what's for you. But there stood Samson, defeated, stripped by a woman. All of his powers was taken from him because he surrendered himself and gave away his secret to a woman. Now, as soon as we got big enough that we could uh, get off the corner and get off a little mission somewhere, we are trying to build churches that's bigger than the next fellow. We want to outshine the Methodists and Presbyterian and Baptists. That's not your purpose. That's not why you are what you are. God already had that. He didn't raise you up for that. He raised you as an example that He might place His power in you. To show forth His glory. But just let a few Rickies get into it. And they'll twist it around and go out after the flowery things of the earth. Most all congregations want some little boy for their pastor. He's got cute curly hair. And you think that he knows more about it than anybody else. But let your body get sick once, and you don't want one of these little doctors that just got out of school if you're going to have an operation and have your heart operate on. Amen. You want an old man that's gray-headed, that's had some experience. Yeah. What the church needs tonight is the old-fashioned gospel that's been proved to be the power of God. Hallelujah. Not some of these little rickies that our seminaries are hatching out. You know that. That's where we're at tonight. That's the conditions we're in. You had no business going into such a mess anyhow. You started falling right there and you've never come back. And you won't as long as you keep on going. Did you ever think, while those Philistines was wondering 
about Samson, did you ever think what was going through Samson's mind? What do you think was going through that man's mind? I believe he was thinking while he was there, he was total blind, never to have his sight again. He was thinking about all the great victories that God had given him. There he was, thinking of the days that was, what they used to do. And um, that's just about the way man is, as I said here some time ago. Man is always thinking back what God did and looking forward to what God will do, but ignoring what God is doing. Look what he's doing now. We know what he has done. And he's sending to us and trying to stir us up again. Trying to bring us back to the path to his word. And prune it by his vindicated word. And we just set sleep. Go home and say, what did he say? I hate to go hear them carry on so long. That was coming in his mind, what we call his heyday, back when he was in the spirit of the Lord, when the Lord answered his prayer. Even before he prayed, as long as he lived for God, God was right on the time. He didn't have time to think about, well, now I've got to pray through now and see if these thousand Philistines, he knew that God was with him. There was no condemnation. So he just grabbed the first thing he had in his hand and went to beating right. He didn't wait till he got a Bachelor of Art or learn how to duel. He just took what was in his hand and started slugging with it. Amen. But today we've learned how to do all the creeds and everything like that and fuss and fight. We don't get nowhere. Amen. We're a bluff like it was in the days of Goliath. Maybe God will send us a David who don't know the creeds but only knows the power of God. <laughs> It's been tested and tried. There the whole church was standing defeated because some big fellow was crying out, the days of miracles is past. But it didn't work when a man of God came up there, a little bitty stoop-shouldered, ruddy-looking fella. But God was with him. He had had an experience. And they said, take this here creed of our church. Go out there and meet him. He said, I've never proved that thing. I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> Come to find out that Saul's ecclesiastical vest didn't fit a man of God. So he threw the thing off and tucked what he knew was right. Yeah, yeah. And today we don't need a bachelor of art or, or some doctor's degree to get into some church or something. The only thing we need is the power and the resurrection of Christ in our lives to take God's Word with the love of God in our hearts that we're sure that God will answer what we ask for. He'll withhold no good thing from them that walk up before Him yeah. rightly. Now, he thought of his great days when there was great days. The church tonight is thinking back about 15 years ago to a revival of divine healing, of the victories. Now, and he is also of God and his people who had failed. That ought to be serious enough that Samson would stop and think that he had failed God. He, it wasn't God's fault he was defeated. It was his own fault. And of the people, God's people, he was raised up to preach the gospel to in his strength. And by flirting with this flappered woman, immoral woman, he had lost all the strength that God had given him. So has it been with the church. God raised the church up to be a lighthouse to let out his powers, to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, live holy, preach the full gospel, manifest it. But we begin to creep in and let down the bars. 
We took the wrong examples. The women acted like the pastor's wife, and he let her go haywire. Cut off her hair, wear any kind of sexy clothes, never rebuked. And the other women say, if Sister so-and-so can do it, I could do it. Don't make that your example. God told you what to do. Stay with that. Now, then when you do that, you fail God and you also fail His people. Failing His people. When you fail them, you fail God. God sets you there to be a watchman. And when you see sin creeping in, instead of cutting the thing off, they entice it. When all the presbyters get together, we're going to have a, a certain thing. We're going to vote this certain doctrine out of the Church of Divine Healing. We, we don't like it. Then you go to voting against it. Oh, it's, that's the way it happened. The Methodists, you Methodists used to have divine healing in the churches. Presbyterian, Lutheran. You had it long ago. You used to have shouting and joy. What happened to it? You got a bunch of little... 1,800 and something rickies. It took the thing to glamour and away it went. And you Pentecostals has done the same thing. That's right. And now you stand just as defeated as them. All organized up in us group. We believe this. If you don't belong to us, you're going to go to hell. What are you doing arguing? You ain't getting nowhere. God's not showing himself any favor to you. Because you stand just as defeated as the rest of them. Because you took the same route they did. Exactly. Now he was a prisoner of the, of the nation that he was raised up to destroy. Here stood that mighty man standing there. A prisoner of the very nation that he was raised up by God to destroy. I don't want to hurt you. But I hope it helps you. And here comes the Pentecostal church that God raised up pulling out of organization for it got them to, and now you're a prisoner of the same clan. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Now you know that's the truth. Amen. Then let somebody say something against it, you're ready to throw them out. It's almost blind leading the blind. Anyone knows that the Pentecostal church 50 years ago was rebuking everything that would organize itself. You were brothers and sisters, and you lived the time, and you talked about the modern church in its fashions, and the women, the way they acted, and the fashions that they did, and the man, and the letting it out of God's Word, and God calls you out of it. And you turned right back around and went right back into the same thing that God called you out of. And the very reason God raised you up to be that, you stand tied to the post of some denomination just as defeated as Samson was. With your eyes punched out to the Word and everything else. That's right. It's too bad. God raised you up to defeat that thing and you joined up with it. Samson come right around and married a woman. Married right into the thing that God pulled him out of. And the church, Pentecostal church, turned right back around and married into the thing that God pulled him out for. Can't deal with a group. God deals with an individual. It's always been his policy. Two men has two different ideas. God gets one man. and he's, That's all he has to have. One man. That's what he's trying to get today. He's trying to get you in his hand. You'll take one here and one there. There'll never be a group, so just get that out of your mind. When you organize right, then you lose your, you lose your birthright. Amen. I want to ask any person, when did you ever see a, a, a man raised up with a message of God, and as soon as he left the earth, they organized it, and as soon as they organized it, died and never did come back again. There's not one, 
one text of Scripture, no word, not one uh, bit of history, not one verse in history that, that shows that any organization or any group of people that ever organized, they lost their spiritual power and never come back again. And not a house of the living God. Spiritual thermometer 40 below zero all the time. That's the way it is. Form of godliness, denying the power thereof. From such turn away. God in those days always raised up someone who would blast that thing right off its foundation and take the little group of church that was left and take it on to victory. He'll do it again. He doesn't change. He's God. God ever says anything, you can never get a better idea. Remember, that's our confidence. God made a way for man to worship Him under the shed blood in Eden. He's never changed it. He can't change it. If He did, He's got a better idea than He had the first time. So He can't have it. It's always the same way. God always raised up a nation that's got off, took a man, and stood Him out there and brought the Word of God to Him and condemned the whole thing. Tucked from there and went on. He'll never take an organization and do it. He'll take you if you'll just listen to Him. Shrine yourself. Yes, the very thing that he was born in the world and empowered to do, he stood a prisoner of that same thing. They had him doing tricks for entertainment. They entertain him. Tricks. Oh, my. Let a, a woman lure him from the Word of God. The Word of God was a secret to him. It was a Nazarite gift. And he should never tell nobody that. But he got to let and lure of a woman. That's what's happened to us today. We've tucked in things in our church that wasn't Christians. There is no church that's setting out saying there's no hypocrites in that church. The whole makeup is full of hypocrites and all kinds. That's right. But I'll give you this assurance. Now, that's in a lodge. You might belong to the Methodist Lodge or the Presbyterian Lodge, but you can't belong to the... You cannot join the church. You can join a lodge, but you can't join a church. You're born into it. And when you're born into that church, there's not a hypocrite in it. Everything in there is saintly and holy. Or you are dead. And your life is hid in God through Christ and sealed by the Holy Ghost. Amen. The devil couldn't get you if he had to. Amen. He'd have to come the same route you did and then he'd be your brother. Glory. See? So you can't do it. Amen. But you can join the church with anything just to get members. Decisions. As I said last night, all we hear today, it seems to be the great rally today is more members, more members. Charts. We beat them. Give them a gift because he brought somebody else in for Sunday school, proselyting. What is he when you got in there? What did he hear? Some little painted up Jezebel talking about her dates the night before or something. Some little literature hanging on the wall. You know that's right. And a Pentecostal sliding right into it. Let somewhere else make up your literature what you teach us. The highest thing in the church is an elder. Amen. Not a bishop. Not some presbyter or something. God deals with the elder of that church. Amen. Right? He gives his church his message and what they have need of. Yes, let a woman lure him away from the Word of God. So have they done it today. How did they do it? Well, now look, I'll tell you, brother so-and-so. Now, you know, them people over there, they do that. They watch this. That's not your example. Christ is your example. He said, I've given you an example. Let him be your example. <laughs> thing, same thing to the churches. That's just exactly what they've done. Let Jezebel, the mother of harlots, Revelation 17, do the same thing. Bring her right back into that same old swing. Now, blinded of spiritual things that's going on. Oh, you don't think so. But you are. Don't tell me. I've been crossing back and forth across this nation for the past 15 years. Blinded! Spiritual things. 
see God come and do just exactly what he said he would do in the last days? He said, well, I tell you, I believe that might be all right, but the, the ministry behind it is not of God. How can God bring bitter and sweet water out of the same fountain? It's not there. Yes, blinded to spiritual things and the Word of God went back to the very same hole they was pulled from. Pentecostals was born out of organization and man took them back in organization. Pentecost is an experience that organization can't stand because it's a personal experience with each individual. Right. Now look at them standing defeated. Whole group. Ministers. Can't have them in a church unless they got a seminary experience. One of our great Pentecostal moves the other day. They have to take their missionaries before a psychiatrist to find out if his IQ's high, high enough to be a missionary. One of our great organizations. See if their IQ's high enough. God never had nothing like that. He said, wait up there until you're endued with power from on high. Then you got your IQ. They don't examine them by what Jesus said to test them by. They test them by their own intellectual conceptions. IQ for a missionary. God didn't say, give him some intellectual power, but he said, you shall receive power from on high. But we're getting away from it. Remember, the Roman Catholic Church was first the Pentecostal Church. That's exactly right. A.D. 33. But because it, Ricky's got into it, we did its way through there. The celebrity. The first thing you know, the Nicaea Council adopted this plan. And they organized. The thing died. The real prophet lived on to his time out. Nearly a thousand years he went through a dark age. That's what God showed the condemnation on the whole system at the beginning. That's right. Ministers go through seminaries. I got a Ph.D. or LLD before they can even pastor a church. Show a fellowship card. Nonsense. The prophet of the Lord walked out of the wilderness and nobody knew where he come from or where he went to. But he had, thus saith the Lord. God proved it. He wasn't in none of their organizations. Amen. That's God's system. That's right. Seminary ministers. What did they do? Worldly dressed women. Wearing shorts, bobbed hair. And men with not enough spirit about them to condemn it. Any man let his wife do that needs a good gospel whipping. Right. Amen. She proves herself dishonorable, and you admit it. Any man would take his wife out on the street with those little old trousers of a thing on the uh, walk out here with so tight the skin on the outside. Walk down the street like that, uh, absolutely a disgrace to humanity. Right. Amen. To me, it shows there is a lack of something inside. Amen. It shows an emptiness. If you want to look pretty, get a little Acts 2.38, little James 5.14, mix it all together. Little John 3.16 and, and all this mixed up together. That'll be cosmetic enough for you. Amen. Max Factures. I see where there's $100 million, $100 billion spent every year just on lipstick or something, one of them things. And missionaries on the field starving. And you say we are the church. Come on. What makes me ashamed? We go in all this glamour, big things. What you doing? It shows that you've taken on the spirit of Jezebel. Amen. Empty. I heard a minister the other day, a fine man. I like him as a man. Belongs to a certain organization. Lives in, across the river from us. And he had a, a radio program. He just come back. It's talking about these here uh, women's wearing all this here blue stuff and, and the stuff over their face. 
Oh, I scared to death the first one I seen. I was in Los Angeles and I was waiting for Brother Argenbright, a Christian businessman. I seen a woman walk up. I thought, poor girl. I, I'm a missionary. I've seen leprosy and I've seen plague. I've never seen nothing like that. I was going to walk up and ask her if I could pray for her. Come to find out here come another one up the same way. I don't blame you trying to look your best, but I, I really be a human about it. Try it. This man said they made a prettier world when they made that stuff. To me, it made a bunch of heathens. Amen. And any woman does it shows there's something lacking in her. Amen. An emptiness that ought to be filled up with Christ. Amen. And any man will let his wife do such a thing, it shows he's empty too. Amen. Amen. And any preacher will stand for it in his church, shows he's got an emptiness also. Amen. And any organization will stand for it shows that they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Back to the Bible. There stood Samson, a victim of such stuff. As an example to us. Great man. Oh, man. How they let him do it. As Samson thought of the uh, eras thought of the things that he had done and how he'd failed God. I wonder, does it ever dawn on people when you hear such messages against it? Wife said to me the other day, said, after somebody bawled me out, said, that wrote me a letter and said, Billy, why don't you keep off them women about their bobbed hair and their, where they're at? Said, people believe you to be a seer. You should teach the women how to get great spiritual gifts. Leave that go. I said, how can I teach them algebra when they won't even learn their ABCs? Right. Yeah. Uh, certainly. Amen. How can you do it? Such a conglomeration of sin. The mark of it shows. Anyone knows that paint is a heathen trait. I'm a missionary. Heathens paint. The Indians painted their faces here in Arizona before they know God. If you ever know God, you don't have to tell them no more about it. <laughs> they take it off. Shows they're at war with God. When they take it off, shows they're at peace with God. Amen. We call ourselves a Christian nation. Call our people, Christian people. I stood in Africa one day where the Lord had brought back to health a man that was so deformed, a little cross-eyed boy, and the things that he had did there in about 15 minutes' time. And I asked how many out of 250,000 that I was speaking to at Durban will receive the Lord Jesus. And they raised up about 30-something thousand. They said, I had 15 interpreters. They said they meant physical healing. I said, I meant salvation. I put it through the interpreters again. I said, all that understand me, they were packing little idols sprinkled with blood. Buckeyes, they were kind of a superstition, lion claws. And I said, you that believe and want to get away from your superstitions and serve the God that's able to make this man whole, standing here as you've seen him done today and even put him back in his right mind. If you want him as your Savior... Show your sincerity. Break your idol on the ground is like a dust storm. And standing there, women who were stark naked besides a clout that hung in the front of them, all up in their waistline was naked. And I said, raise your hands and pray a sinner's prayer and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I said, upon the same grounds that you stand on, Raise up your hands now and accept Christ's baptism of the Spirit. Some ministers here will baptize you in Christian baptism. And when they raise their hands, them women who didn't know right and left hand come in there perfectly naked. But when they walked away, they even folded their arms to get out of the presence of the company. Amen. One man's time with Jesus Christ made them know they were naked. And today, year by year, we strip more off and take more off. And oh, I never, and they ain't called it God. What's done it? Your organizations that permits you to do it. 
That's right. The system that you was raised up to clean yourself out of, you brought it right back in again. I hope I don't sound sacrilegious. I hope I'm... Uh, it isn't sacrilegious. It's a word of the Lord. Amen. Certainly it is. Now, how we find out that while Samson stood there looking over his era, looking what had been done in his inner conscience, that he had, he had failed God. He had failed God's people. And there he stood as an example of thinking back what he was and thinking now what he was. And when he did that, he cried out, Oh, if the church tonight would stand still a minute and look back to the day of Pentecost, look back to where we started from, and realize the condition our creeds and fussings has got us into, Cry out again. Samson cried, Lord, God, revenge my two eyes. If we could cry that same penitent cry, Lord, God, these things has got me blind all these times. He knew there was a price to pay. You know it now. Me and my wife said to me, she said, you go back across the nations, back and forth all the time, preaching, you go right back, the people's just doing the same thing. What good does you? I said, in the day of the judgment, Amen. there'll be a tape recording Amen. on God's great tape. Yes. You're not ignorant of these things. God will blast it across the skies. He's got to have a voice there to condemn the world by the voice is a gospel. Revenge me, Lord, of mine enemies. Revenge my eyesight. They poked it out, Lord, and here I stand. Samson also knew there was a possibility that God might once again hear him. Even in his conditions, there was a possibility. Oh, church. There is a possibility, regardless of all they're doing. As we hear today, so much, so many made decisions. Decisions. Decisions means a stone, a confession. As I've said before, what good does a stone do if you haven't got a stonemason there with a sharp word to cut that stone into a place stone for the building? What good does it do to make decisions if you still let the woman and the man remain as he was in his charm in the church? It's a pile of stones that's not shaped into nothing. Amen. What we need is a stonemason, a man with the Word of God, a vindicated power to prove that God sent him to shape that church and cut off the worldly things and shape them into the stones of the sons and daughters of God to go into his building. Amen. Certainly right. Oh, my. He knew the possibility, so that there could be God would hear prayer if we could only do that tonight. Jesus said when he was here on earth, the, John 14, 12, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. Jesus said, or the Bible said in Hebrews 13, 8, that was quoted a while ago, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we call this denominational life in us the life of Christ, and do the things that we do, well, I call ye me Lord and keep not my commandments. Amen. See? Why well, call you that? Oh, if you haven't got five members in your church, get the truth to it. A possibility. They're same now, a possibility. But they of the day don't seem to catch the vision like Samson did. They don't seem to get it. They, well, I'm pretty well settled down. Now, we have good churches and we haven't got none. See, the Bible said that rich lady I'll see a church age would have need of nothing and not know that she was naked, blind, miserable, 
and don't even know it. Now, if you've seen a person come down the street that was naked and blind, and you could tell them if they were in that shape, they were naked. They had to get somewhere and get hid. Well, you, there's a possible that you could bring the person off the street. But when they turn around with not mental powers enough to know it. But now the church hasn't got spiritual power enough to know it. Naked, miserable, blind, wretched, poor. Christ on the outside knocking, trying to get in. And yet you say you have need of nothing. I know that's foreign to some of you, but it's God's truth. The Word says so. They don't catch the vision. You can tell them about it. It just goes right off. Maybe right then there's a little conviction. Tomorrow it's all forgotten about. They go right on back to the card party and all the stitch and sew and, and blown to all these things, and that's all forgotten about. God can do something or another for somebody, and, oh, well, it just happened, see. The devil's just got their mind so poisoned up with the things that they don't know where they're at themselves. Sit tight. Oh, they can clap their hands and holler, Amen, dance in the Spirit. <laughs> that don't mean one thing. I've seen heathens do that. Amen. <laughs> right. Have great gatherings. Oh, you say, we still have revival, Brother Branham. Uh-huh. What kind of revival? You have church gatherings. It's down in Kentucky. We used to call it protractive meetings, and that's about what it does, protractive. It's become far from attractive from the gospel. Yes, they say, oh, we had a meeting. You know what? We got Dr. So-and-so to come in the city, and we had thousands. All the churches cooperate together. What do we do? We have a revival. Bring the people back to the Word of God, and God go to work in the church. What do we do? We have a bunch of getting together and glittering with worldly tinsel. That's exactly right. <laughs> Scholarship, Hollywood showmanship. <laughs> or you say, that's the Baptist, that's the Pentecostals. <laughs> right. Up on the platform, women jumping and dancing and uh, horrible looking with little old tight dresses on it. Uh, I, uh, it's a shame. I can't even find words right now. It's a shame. Man sitting there on a glory to God, hallelujah. What kind of a spirit have you got anyhow? You think Jesus would shout at such as that? He could damn it! You think Isaiah raised on the scene, Jeremiah, Amos, one of those prophets of the Old Testament rise on the scene uh, like they did and see the things they seen going on, how they cry out against it. Yes. Said the very God that you claim to serve will destroy you. Yes. You'd say the same thing today. Certainly would. That don't mean a thing. Showmanship. We got too much Hollywood. But it don't bring the spirit and power of God down. Might bring enthusiasm, but it don't bring power of God. They're not willing to pay the price. Amen. Samson prayed right. What did he pray? In closing, you might say this Lord, let me die with the enemy. That's the trouble. You don't want to pay the price of dying. You got your own self worked up into a community into a bunch of people that you associate with and play cards. Stay home and watch program, eat tater chips and drink Cokes. The church sets empty. That's right. Make you sign a card. You'll come six months out of the year to Sunday school. Such man-made enthusiasm. What you need is the Holy Ghost. Oh, you say, I got it. You sure don't act like it. Yes, sir. Amen. Let the preacher preach an hour or something like that. You're ready to call the trustee board and throw him out. Amen. Right. Oh, you, you want to eat your cake and keep it too. Can't do that. No, sir, you've got to surrender yourself. You've got a price to pay. got a cleaning up to do. And I'll tell you, the whole church world needs a cleaning all the way from the pulpit to the janitor's room. That's right the truth. Not willing to pay. But Samson prayed right when he said, Lord, let me die with these Philistines. 
He had failed, but let me die. You must be ready to die to the enemy that's got this victory over you. You must be willing to surrender your own ideas. Samson is willing to pay the price to get, to get the power of God again. I wonder if you women are willing to let your hair grow out. I wonder if you men have got enough courage to tell her that. You're supposed to be the head of the house. She's the neck. She turns you. That's contrary. Do you think a shaking revival will ever take these women out of these public offices? Policemen on the streets and things? She ought to be in a kitchen. You think you'd ever be able to get her back to that again? No, sir. She'll never do it. Unless she gets saved, then she'll do it. You won't have to tell her nothing about it. She'll find her place. The Holy Ghost will lead her to her place. But say the Holy Ghost is leading me to that contrary to the Word. Don't call that the Holy Ghost. Are you willing to pay the price? That's a Pentecostal church. Are you willing to pay the price? That's it. You see what kind of a shame we're standing in? All right. Samson is willing to pay the price to get the power of God again. Oh, I hear some of you say, we got revivals, old Brother Brandon, but what do you get after you get the revival? Billy Graham said in his message, Louisville, Kentucky, when I said it with him at the breakfast, he stood up there and took the Bible. He said, this Bible is God's way of doing things. How true that is. But then do it, it's the next thing. <laughs> he said, Paul went into a city and he made a convert. He left that convert there, one convert in the city. Next year he went back, and that convert had 30 or 40 converted and brought into Christ. He said, I go into a city, and what I do, I have 30,000 con- conversions, decisions. He said, I come back within a year, I haven't got 30. He said, what's the matter? Then he pointed to the preacher and says, it's you lazy preachers. Set with your feet up on the desk and don't go visit the people. Now, that was a whole lot of truth in that. That's right. But it wasn't all the truth. Like the man eating watermelon, he said, give him a bite the old dark. And he said, oh, that was fine, but surely there's some more of it. <laughs> and that's right. And here's what it was. Who was me to say to that great evangelist? Who was me to speak a word to a man like Billy Graham? Far be it from me, that's God's servant. I wouldn't speak to, about it unless he would ask me. And uh, maybe I could say something. But I'd like to say this, Billy. What lazy preacher kept his feet up on the desk on Paul's conversion, one he had? Wasn't a preacher in the country. What was it? Paul never left him on a decision. When he made his decision, he stood there with the Word of God and cut him into a son of God. Then you couldn't keep him still. That's what Samaria Day, all these decisions needs to be cut down to sons and daughters of God. Clean up! And get back to the Word, back to the Gospel. Yeah. Certainly. That's what we need. Yes, we have a revival today, but what is it? It's a denominational revival. The Baptists had a slogan, a million more in 44. What'd you get? Was that a church? Or this having a revival, they said. And they had to let out and give intermission for 15 minutes for the people to go out and smoke between Sunday school and that, and the pastor smoked also. The Bible said, cleanse yourself from all unclean habits. Amen. What are we going to do about it? Well, he said, it's not right. The Holy Ghost, when he comes, he'll teach you all these things. Okay? Certainly did. And somebody said something about divine healing, and they claimed it was in another day. <laughs> See? Pointing off to what was. Maybe it'll be over in a millennium. What do you need divine healing in a millennium for when you're immortal? The day is the day. Amen. This is the day. Amen. Say, well, we have revivals. Look at the moral decay in the church. Look how corruptible it's getting every year. Look at our Pentecostal groups, how it's fallen. Shut your eyes and think of it 15 years ago when I was here. Then look out and see what you got today. You know that's the truth. 
It's a sin and shame. That's right. Getting further and further away from the Word of God all the time. Samson knew his backslidden to the conditions. He knew he couldn't have strength to meet the challenge of the hour. Though he was there, all of his machinery was there. The same muscles that could take the jawbone and beat down a million Philistines. The same muscles hung on the same man. The same shoulders that could pack the gates of gaze up on top of the mountain with still the same muscles hanging on him. Oh, I can see something here. But he knew that he couldn't meet the challenge of the hour. So does the church know, and it's moral corruption. We'll never meet the challenge of the hour. Amen. Communism's taking the whole thing over. And what are we trying to do? Find consolation by joining up with, yoking up these people, denominations who don't even believe in divine healing, the power of God. Amen. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? We yoke ourselves up amongst stuff like that and then expect God. We say, big numbers. God don't notice big numbers. God looks for character. I said, Ella Ezer sweated it out till he found character. <laughs> and Rebecca, then he had to get her dressed up, ready, let her stand still and listen at his message. The trouble of it is today, when you find characters, it's hard to make them stand still long enough to put on clothes and get dressed up. <laughs> some little Ricky's done pulled him off in some other direction. That's right. But there, Ella Ezer sweated it out. Now, Samson knew that he did not have the strength, though he had the muscles. We've got all our machinery. We've got the great district presbyters. We've got all the bishops. We've got the archbishops. We've got the popes. We've got the hierarchies. We've got all the machinery. We've got the buildest, biggest buildings and most of the money of the earth. What good does it do us? It's a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. That's right. But we know we're not able to meet the challenge of the hour. Today in Russia, communism has taken the world. What's the matter? It's somebody that's got the audacity to stand up under conviction so it's wrong. Only 1% of Russia is communist. 1%. 99% is still so-called Christianity free. But they haven't got the IQ of the gospel. They haven't got what it takes. Though they got the money, they got all of this, but they haven't got the courage and the grace. What God needs in Russia is one man anointed with the power of God, with the power of the Holy Ghost. Samson knew what he needed. We might turn the whole America back and never one of them go to church. We still haven't got it. God hasn't got what it takes. The disciples didn't have it till they went to Pentecost. Jesus told them they didn't have it after being preaching for three years. Still they needed it. The church needs it. That's right. Notice, Samson knew that he was in need. He wasn't sufficient. The denominations can't produce it. They don't vindicate the Word. They teach it against it. You know, but Samson realizing that, that he was insufficient in himself, though he had all his regime, he still was insufficient watching the Philistines gloating over their victory. They never noticed him turning his head upwards. His lips moving back and forth in prayer. The tears running down out of the sockets that he once had eyes in. They didn't notice that. They just, they was having too big a time. He wanted God to manifest himself again to this Jezebel. Oh, if we could have some Samson's to rise. Oh, church. Not a new denomination. Start another creed or latter reign. We need the power of God. Right. He was aware of what would happen if God ever answered his prayer, but he was ready to face the issue. He was in dead earnest. Oh, if the church tonight 
would only stand in that condition. In dead earnest, knowing that you're going to have to give up everything you hold dear in this world. If men and women are ready tonight to know that it's going to separate you from everything of the world. Ministers, they're going to quit packing you on the back and telling you, Dr. So-and-so, it was marvelous. Will you go swimming with us this afternoon? Take the bunco games out of the church and the races and almost lottery. Bunko is lottery. And all these soup suppers that pray the preacher get back to God's system of tithing. Amen. Come back to the Word. Are they willing to do it? No, sir, they were not. You know what a price it takes? That woman will call you old-fashioned again. God will call you blessed. Are you willing to die? That's what's the trouble of it. You want to stay alive to Hollywood the same time be alive with God. It won't mix. Amen. A seed Jesus said and set the corn and wheat fall into the ground and die. It abides alone. You'll never bring forth anything. Oh, Jesus' name, church. What a glorious church. What a glorious name, Jesus' name. Are you ready to die? Are you assemblies of God, general assemblies? Are you ready to die? Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, are you ready to die out to your enemy? Are you willing to pay the price of sacrifice? Really, sincerely. Not just come and say, well, I'll give it a try and see how it come out. You're not ready yet. You must be ready to pay the price and die. You fathers, you mothers, are you ready to establish a halter in your house and take that television out? Amen. Are you ready to take that deck of cards off the table, them comic books at your children's reading? Amen. Preparing their little minds for a blast that the devil's going to give them. Are you ready to establish the old family altar again? Or do you just want to continue on the way you are? If you want to continue on, you're not in condition of coming yet. But I pray that you're like Samson. You see the price and you're ready. Amen. Lord, let me die with him. You know if God answered his prayer, what was going to talk? Many people, I've seen them right since I've been here, come to the altar and the Holy Spirit come to them and they don't want to die. They want to stay alive in the world. You can't serve two gods at the same time. Are you ready to forsake everything to serve God? Listen and cry, Lord, only this once more. Is the Pentecostal church, the general council, the assemblies of God, the church of God, all the rest of you, willing to pay the price? Are you willing to say it once more, Lord? Here I stand. I didn't have the audacity, the very Christian spirit, to shake hands with my oneness brother Amen. or my Trinitarian brother. I didn't have the audacity to do it. I didn't have the grace to do it. Now I see where it's got me to. Yes. Broke up in organizations and disfellowshipping. There's a congregation so poisoned against one another that they hardly speak to each other on the street. When we're molded into one clay by the Holy Ghost. Are you willing to cry out once more, Lord? Let it happen. If you are, God will sure hear your prayer. Watch when that man with all that fiber standing there, his great regime, but he was still blind. He knew the price. He knew the possibility. And he said, Once more, Lord! Once more! Avenge me! On my eyesight. When he made that prayer, God answered it. Every fiber of his body began to tighten up. The Spirit began to come on those muscles. Oh, if we could have the Spirit to come on our Wednesday night prayer meeting on our Sunday school. Feel the fibers of the muscles of God's power tightening up. 
where the Holy Spirit could come in, not in a mockery, but in a genuine spirit to reveal the secret of the heart and to straighten up the sin that's in there. Cast out the evil. As his fibers begin to tighten, let me die with them. I was born to destroy them. Let me die with them. And his fibers, his muscles tightened up. His great, huge muscles received strength. The Holy Spirit began to move up on him. And he twisted that rock with his mighty power. And down she went. All we need is a sincere prayer. Once more, Lord. When we are to be in the promised land, we're still wandering around in the wilderness. Like Israel. Wanted a law, something they could do. You can't do nothing about it except Christ. We wanted a doctrine, something that we could puff up ourselves by and get a different class of people from the other fella. See where we got? Blinded. All right. Down went the great denomination. <laughs> it's always been that way when God comes in. The other things fall. Dan was Samson's greatest victory. Oh, I wish I could see the church of the living God stand tonight. Once more, Lord. Once more. Send us a revival. If it costs me everything, if it costs everything, I got send me a revival. Send it up on me, Lord. Here this group of about 300 people or more here tonight. Cry out with one voice. Lord God, once more. Let me see Jesus Christ the same yesterday day and forever. Let me know that He's near me. Let me know that He's sure to take care of me. I'm willing now. Oh. Give over. The whole enemy was destroyed. Pentecostal stands at that post tonight. Things that you were born to destroy. Take it over. Repent. Call aloud. Lord, once more. Once more, let us see it. Let me say this, my friend. You better destroy your enemy before your enemy destroys you. Bring back the old-fashioned prayer meetings. Old-fashioned repentance when they stayed to the altar until they was dead and finished with sin. You never seen a woman go to the altar and die to sin and the next day come back with bobbed hair? Paint on her face? There's no such. The Holy Spirit teaches. Nature does it. The nature of the Holy Spirit. You never seen women going out and dressing sexy, coming to try to cover themselves up. You never seen man that was afraid to stand up and afraid his little wife would leave him or something or because he took the initiative. Well, man were man in them days. They spoke. They were man. They governed their house. They were the head of the house. But this fancy American, I just learned from a little Greek scholar sitting here looking at me now. Come over from Greece, a scholar in Greeks. And he began to play my tapes and he watched the message. He said, I know that you haven't even got an education. But Brother Branham, your words and your message run perfect with the Greek interpretation of the Bible. So that's exactly right. What you said, it's exactly right. And he come to me. You just tell me the lady I'll see her means woman in Greek. This is a woman's world. It's a woman's church. It's a woman's age. Say, well, man, we'll do it. When did God ever get in that condition? <laughs> yes, are you ready to bring back a revival? Are you ready? woman said, I have a right to do what I want to do. That's my American privilege. It's your American privilege. It's your God-given privilege. A sheep, a goat will always kick up a fuss. But a sheep stands still and forfeits its rights. Amen. If you're a real child of God, you forfeit your American rights. To the Holy Spirit and let Him mold you and make you like He should be. Once more, Lord. Oh, my. Oh, church! Leave Hollywood Delilah. She's going to kill you. She's choking the spiritual life out of you. Leave her! Your Hollywood showmanship on the platform. Your Hollywood, your tinsels, our meeting has got to be so it's just got to be all in the great big like the rest of the world. It's got to be in the biggest churches. The evangelists come to town, he had promised him so much money he won't come. 
How ridiculous. Shows where your treasure is. Your heart's there. Turn wholehearted to God and to His Word. Let's cry out once more, Lord. Once more. Show us your presence. Jesus said a little while, and the world, that's cosmos, I believe there, brother, the world order won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, the believer, for I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the age. The works that I do shall you also. More than this shall you do, for I go unto my Father. He that believeth in me, the works that I do shall he do also. Not make believeth, but believeth. Oh, church, we agree Jesus is not dead. He's raised from the dead. He's right here now. If I didn't have that support, I wouldn't say what I say. I know He's here. And He proves Himself here. He's always here to vindicate His Word. If He stood here tonight, what would He say? He'd come right back to the Word again and say the same thing that He did say. Now you say, was that Jesus talking? Well, if it wasn't, I sure wouldn't want to say it. <laughs> Certainly. How can it be proved? Bow your head a minute. Heavenly Father, your servants can speak all they desire to speak. And we might bring truth ever so clear to the people. But still, it's merely just an emotion. It's still just the lips of a human being speaking. The congregation, Lord, you're supernatural. And wherever you are, there's supernatural signs. There's miracles performed, things that cannot be explained. When you were here on earth, you walked up and down among the people. You healed the sick. A woman touched your garment one time. And you turned around and said, Who touched me? You did not know yourself. Who touched me? But the God that was in you, you knew the secret of the heart because the Bible says the Word of God is stronger and sharper than a two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. And you looked down, the little woman couldn't hide herself, and you told her her faith had saved her. You said, I do nothing till the Father shows me first. The Father worketh and I worketh hitherto. If you were here tonight, you'd do just as the Father showed you to do. And I pray, Lord, that you can bring this church once more. Lord God, this people is made up here tonight of all different churches, Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Pentecostals, and all kinds of brands up on them. You don't look at brand, you look for the blood tag. I pray, Heavenly Father, that tonight that the people will ignore their brand they're wearing. And remember, Pentecost is not an organization. It's an experience that comes to any man or woman that will trust you. Heal the sick, Lord. Save the lost. Get honor into thyself. Now, I commit this audience with these broken up words, Lord. I'm not eloquent. I'm not sufficient. To bring the word, but I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit will take these things and reveal them and make them known by the attitude that they were given by. Not to be feel inferior, but to feel very humble. Not to be different, but to be truthful and honest with the people as I would be with God. For if I cannot be honest with His children, how can I be honest with Him? I pray, God, that You'll vindicate this this night. Right before the people now that they might know that they're living in the shadows of time. That the message of the hour is to repent and turn back again to the faith of the fathers. Grant it that I commit it to you. Save sinners. Fill believers. Heal the sick. Bring glory. And may we all cry with one accord. Once more, Lord. Once more. Let it be once more. We ask in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed. Prayerfully. Won't you consider this? Is it me, Lord? What can I do? What, what must I do? Just search yourself while the music plays softly. Think of this little broken up message. Don't look at the messenger. Think of what, what the message is.
Now, as you feel that you have need of God, just raise up your hands slowly as you keep your heads bowed. Lord, remember me. Don't care what you have need of. Remember me, O oh Lord. Have faith now in God. No doubt. Just believe. Hold your request till God speaks to you and say, I'll give you your request. Lord, I stand blinded to you. I'm ashamed of myself. I stand. Professing to be a Christian and living the way I live, I'm ashamed of myself. Have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me. Heal me physically. Heal me spiritually. Make me yours. I feel your spirit upon me. Brother Branham said that you were here with us. I, I believe it now because I feel you. I know you're here. God of heaven will answer your prayer. Just believe now. Just let it, the message get down deep in you. Pray, have faith, don't doubt, believe. Now, Lord, I've given this space of time that men and women, boys and girls could think this over. This has been a strange message to some, no doubt. But, Lord, you know it's true. Sitting in the room this afternoon, you, you brought this to my memory of this great man that once lived for you, and the condition he got in. Now, Father, as Samson was willing to die, die out to himself, die with his enemy, to bring God's victory and the promise back. May we, with all of our church entity and all of our difference, die out to our own thinking and accept your word. Die out to the thoughts that we've been told the days of miracles is past, when we know that that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Grant, Lord, that this audience will see the moving of the hand of God once more, and then they may come and repent, and there will be a great meeting. And may from this little church go forth a revival that will slay all the Philistines of the worldliness throughout the country. May it be an example. As these people go from here tonight, we pray that you'll come in like you did on the road to Emmaus, you talk with those men all through the day. They were talking about you, and you were talking right to them. They didn't know you. Many people, your Lord goes to church, and they're sincere. And they really are not taught any different. But then when you got them into the room that night and closed the doors, you did something just like you did before your crucifixion. Then they knew you had raised from the dead. They hurried back with light feet and light hearts, and told the disciples, with light hearts, they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? Grant that to happen once more, Lord. Come into this audience and do the things you did before your crucifixion, that this audience might know that thy unprofitable servant has not lied to them, but told them the truth. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we could no wise have a prayer line called up if there is cards. I don't, don't think there's any. We got cards give out from a few nights ago. I don't think they give out any tonight. But they got cards here. But if we had, you couldn't have a prayer line. See, we were messed up. Now, but we'll, we'll get it finished. But how many people in here that are sick? Let's see your hands. Raise up your hand if you have a need of God. Or need of somebody else having a need, raise up your hand. Just pray. Now, be reverent. Now, let's just not fail to get this message now. Listen. If Jesus was standing here with this suit on, and you'd run up on the platform and say, Lord Jesus, heal me, you know what he'd say to you? 
I've already done it. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. The price is done paid. You'd have to believe it. You say, but if I could believe that he was close to me, if I know he was here, if I, that, that's been 2,000 years ago. Well, the Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we'd like to see him. If we would see him, he'd act like he did. Now I'm going to give for you, minister, brethren, some scripture. The New Testament says that he's a high priest now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? How did he act as was when he was on earth, he was a high priest? Well, he was more than that. He was God. How could, how could the people get something from him? A little woman touched his garment and sat down. And Jesus turned and said, Who touched me? And all of them denied it. But his, the Spirit of God that was in Christ making him Emmanuel, turned around till he found in the audience a little woman and told her what her condition was. Said, your faith saves you. Is that right? Well, now, if he is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, if it's the same high priest, he'd act the same way. Now, you're strangers to me, most of you. I know Brother Dalton and them sitting here on this front seat right here, this group right here, because they're from back in Kentucky. I've known him for years. And I'm not mistaken, I believe way back in the back I've seen Brother Gene Gold and Brother Leo Mercer. I'm not sure. Glad to see you, brethren. I see Brother and Sister Dallas sitting here. I don't want you people, if you got anything wrong with you, just wait, not now. I want somebody that don't know me, knows I don't know you. I want you to pray. And then, if he is the same yesterday and forever, you touch his garment. And His Holy Spirit will operate through us if you've got the right channel of Spirit to believe by. The same channel that's here, it'll operate the same way. It's got to. It's God. You put the life of an apple tree in a peach tree, it won't bear peaches no more. It'll bear apples. And you put the life of Christ in us, in a man that's a mortal being, He'll bear the fruit of the Spirit. He'll bear the fruits of the resurrection. Christ delivered this message and this this message to the church to take it. Go ye into all the world and to every creature. Millions have never heard it yet. Nations has never heard it yet. How long? All the world to every creature. These signs shall follow them and believe. How far? All the world. Who to? Every creature. There's where he commissioned the church. Now show me in the scripture where he's taking that back away. Man might inject their idea, but that's not God's idea. He said, all the world to every creature.